uh, in uh, many of the parts of, of the uh, last pra practical class. So I'll go through some very common thresholding um, methods and, and really give a rationale for why you would want to threshold a graph um, in the first place. Um, I'll then move on to degree distribution and characterizing and visualizing degree distribution. So once you've, you've mapped a connectome and you've performed basic operations such as thresholding, one of the first things that, that, that you'd often look at is the, the nodal degree and the degree distribution. So by looking at the degree distribution, this can provide us some clues about the roles of particular nodes and the function of the network um, as, a, as a whole. And then finally, in the last part of this lecture, I'll move on to characterizing paths and path lengths. So a fundamental um, the function of a network is really to communicate information between the different elements, the different nodes of, 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 the, uh, of the system. And so fundamental to understanding is we need to know how this information is communicated across the, the edges and what are the actual paths um, along which the information flows. And I'll present some very simple models which can be used to characterize information flow in a network. So let's begin with thresholding. So thresholding is a really basic, it's a simple operation to understand. Um, it's not an essential operation to perform on a graph, uh, but there's many advantages to performing thresholding before going on to doing any further um, graph analysis. <coughs> and so in a nutshell, thresholding is really about throwing away the weak connections in your graph. So once you've mapped your uh, structural connectome with diffusion MRI, or if you've mapped your connectome with, with fMRI, there might be some connections that are spurious. So in other words, there's streamlines between pairs of nodes um, that, are, that are genuinely disconnected. And so we want to eliminate those streamlines. So a simple way to do this is to, thre is to set a, a, a threshold uh, that I've denoted here by tau. And any connection that has an edge weight which is less than tau is eliminated from the network. So in other words, it's set to a value of zero. So in the example here, I've shown the, the, the initial um, unthresholded graph. And here I've put a moderate threshold. So this would correspond to a moderate value of tau. And I've removed the very weak edges. And in this example here, I've applied a more severe threshold where I've eliminated both the weak edges as well as the moderate edges and I only have this graph that's, uh, that's remaining. Um, there's also one further step that we can do once we've thresholded a graph, we can set the remaining edges, the edges that survive this threshold to a value of one. And this then gives us a binary graph. And so in a binary graph, the edges either have um, a value of one or zero. So we're only interested in the absence or the presence um, the presence of an edge. So you might wonder why would we do this? Why would we want to threshold or binarize a graph? There's really three reasons for, for threshold. The first is, as I've already mentioned, it can assist in removing spurious edges. So if the, if the assumption holds true that the, the, the spurious edges are, uh, have a weak uh, weight, thresholding will eliminate those. The second reason is it can emphasize particular topological properties. And the third reason is for, for, for very large graphs, it can ease the computational and storage burden because many of the elements in the graph have a zero and therefore we can use a sparse graph representation. So there's really two classes, two very broad classes of thresholding methods. We have global thresholding, um, and I've given you three examples there. There's weight and density-based thresholding. These are the most common, commonly used thresholding techniques in the connectomics literature. There's also consensus thresholding. And the PRAC this afternoon will specifically focus on those two methods, weight and, and density-based uh, uh, thresholding. On the other hand, we also have local thresholding methods, which um, are not as popular as, as global methods. But these allow us to enforce particular topological properties of, of the threshold of connectome. And they also allow us to take into account heterogeneity in the edge weight. So there might be a certain part of the network where overall we have low edge weights and another part where the edge weights are in general quite high. If we use a global technique, as I think I've shown in this slide here, 
we essentially just have a, we apply a clock. So what I've shown here is the weight distribution on the y-axis and the, uh, the edge weight. If we apply a global threshold, all that we're doing is we're chopping away, we're throwing away all of the low edge, the, the, the edges with low weights. In contrast with the local thresholding method, it's a little more nuanced in the sense that we might be removing edges based on a more sophisticated criteria. So there might be in areas of the network where we have very high edge weights, we might put the threshold up a little higher. In other areas, the threshold might be a little lower. I'll give you some examples of those. So the simplest approach is, is weight-based thresholding. And in this case, as I mentioned, we have a single weight-based threshold. I denoted, I denoted that with tau in the previous slide. Um, and we say any value that in the connectivity matrix that is less than tau be set to zero. So all of these black elements um, in the matrix have been set to zero because they have a value that is less than the tau. And then if you're interested, a further step is to binarize so the remaining elements in that matrix are set to one. So the reason why you might want to binarize is that we might not have a, 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 a strong confidence in the actual edge weights. So with a lot of the connectome mapping techniques, uh, the edge weight distribution can span many orders of magnitude. And we might not have a lot of accuracy in the way that we've, we've, we've mapped these. And so by binarizing them, we take away um, any uncertainty distribution of edge weights. A common question is how do we choose this threshold? So what I said here, we have to choose a particular threshold and that's how we binarize. Um, there's various ways to do this. Uh, one way is, is that we consider a range of thresholds and we repeat our graph analysis over the range of thresholds. The key point there is we don't want to conduct an analysis and, and come up with a result and that result is contingent on that one arbitrarily chosen threshold. And if you change the threshold a little bit, our result changes dramatically. That's one thing that we want to guard against. So by considering a range of thresholds, uh, we can ensure that our, our, our graph analysis is consistent across that range. Uh, another way in, in the genetics literature, it's often that the, the, the threshold is chosen such that the resulting threshold of graph has a particular uh, property. So for example, we might choose the threshold to ensure that the, de that the degree distribution is, is scale free. I'll describe what that means in one of the, uh, the later sections. So weight based thresholding. Essentially the difference between weight and, and density thresholding comes about when we're interested in looking at groups of subjects. When we're only interested in one subject, in one network, the, di the difference between weight and density thresholding is they're essentially the same, the same thing. So in this example here, imagine that we have two subjects. We've mapped a connectome um, for two subjects. That's the, that's the unthreshold of subject one, subject two. And we apply a threshold such that we remove the, the weak edges. And so in this case, you see on the right, we've, we've taken away, actually we've removed both the weak and, and the moderate edges. And so the threshold of graph is that, and that, that one there. So what the first thing that you notice here is that subject one has seven edges in his or her threshold of graph, whereas subject two has only three edges. So if you were then to go on and do some further graph analysis, and for example compare a particular graph measure between subject one and subject two, you might find a difference between those two subjects, but that might be trivially due to the difference in the number of edges. So we know that many graph measures, many network measures are dependent on the number of edges in the graph. So if the number of edges change, the network measure changes. So you could compare these two subjects, you come with a difference, but that might be trivially due to the fact that subject two has a lower number of, of edges. And this is where density um, based thresholding comes in. Density based thresholding is where Rather than putting a threshold on the edge weight, we now allow the threshold to vary from subject to subject in such a way that each subject in their threshold of graph has the same number of edges. So in this case here, we see that subject one once again has one, two, three, four, five, six, has eight edges. But in this case, we've lowered the edge weight threshold so that subject two also has the same uh, number of edges, so our weight-based threshold would be lower here. 
the reason for doing this is that once when we compare these two subjects, we can then be sure that a difference in a particular topological or network property is not simply due to a difference in the number of edges. Of course, the, the, or, or, a, or a disadvantage of this is that you can say, well, okay, we've matched these subjects in terms of the number of edges, but we've really done that just by bringing in some very low or potentially spurious edges, right? We've added in these uh, these weak edges between these, these nodes here. So on one hand, while we've matched them in terms of number of edges, we could have also, it can also be argued that we're adding in spurious edges and this can confound our analysis. The presence of these spurious edges can, can uh, confound analysis. So, so in summary, with weight-based thresholding, we set the same threshold for every subject, but this can result in a different number of edges in the threshold of graph. With density-based thresholding, we ensure there is the same number of edges for every subject, but there is a potential that we can, because we're lowering the bar for some subjects, that we could be adding spurious edges. So this is an example of the difference between density and weight-based thresholding in a, st in a study of schizophrenia uh, patients. So generally what we see in schizophrenia is that controls overall have a stronger uh, mean connectivity strength. So this is the, the distribution of connectivity strength in controls is the blue, the red is the, the patients, and you can see that the blue is shifted a little to the right because con the, the connectivity is stronger in the, uh, in the controls. And what we see here is with, with weight-based uh, thresholding, if we set our threshold on the edge weight to be 0.2, the resulting connection density, for, so you might be asking what's connection density? Connection density is just the number of edges in the thresholded graph divided by the total number of possible edges in, in the graph. So it's, it's functionally dependent on the, on the number of edges. So because patients are overall have a lower connectivity strength, we only have a density of 53% in patients. And therefore we have this, con if we were to compare patients and controls, we have this confound of difference in connection density. So the patients have fewer connections relative to controls. In contrast, when we use density-based thresholding, we need to lower the bar a little for the patients, right? Remember the patients have overall lower density, so we have to lower the bar to a value of 0.31, lower the threshold to 0.31, to ensure that both the patients and the controls are matched in terms of connection density. So the patients both have a connection, patients and controls both have a density of uh, 20%. Uh, and this it allows us to be sure that any differences that we find between the two groups is not due to a difference in the number of edges between the patients and controls. Another global thresholding technique uh, which has been recently proposed is referred to as consensus thresholding. The basic rationale for consensus thresholding is we want to identify connections that are consistently found across a group of subjects. So if a, sub, if, a, if a connection is consistently present across a group of subjects, this provides us some assurance that, that is a, it's a genuine connection. Um, the assumption here is, is that, that, that noisy connections are not um, consistently found across subjects, but that may not always be the case. So errors can sometimes be systematic. So the way that this works, we, we, we only keep connections that are of strength at least rho in a certain percentage of subjects. So in this example, I have three subjects. This is the th unthresholder, this is the thresholder. I set my row to be a strong connection. So the, the strongest connection is, is denoted with this, with, the, with this width. And I need that to be present in at least two, th two thirds of the, the subjects. So for example, um, if I take um, this edge here, we see that while this connection is strong in subject one, uh, it's only weak, it's weak in subject two and, and moderate here, and therefore it doesn't appear in the thresholded um, graph. In contrast, when we look at this connection here, which does appear in the thresholded graph for subject two, this is a weak connection. So you say, well, why is that connection present if it's weak? Well, the reason is, if you look in subject one, it's a strong connection here, it's a strong connection here, and this is a weak. So it's in, in two of the three subjects, so namely in subject one and three, 
it's strong, so therefore it survives in the threshold of graph. That's referred to as consensus um, threshold. Yep. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a parameter that you need to choose. So you could set that to be, say, 50% of subjects. Um, the higher you put that up, the higher the, the percentage, the more sparse the graph will become. So this could also be a case where you might want to look at different percentages and perform your analysis, so if you're interested in a particular measure, perform the analysis for different values of x and see how consistent it is. So sorry. Uh, for example, uh, you define as uh, 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 two two from three, but uh, yeah. there may be no one edge combined. No edges. Yeah, if you put the threshold up high enough, there could be a scenario. I mean, there might be some edges that it could. You know, the, the 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 basic idea is that there's some very robust edges that are going to be consistently found across all the individuals. So. In a real connect home, it would probably be very rare that you find no edges that are consistent. If that was the case, you'd probably have a little bit of worry about your connect home mapping technique if you find no consistency across any individuals. But I think that um, in general, you're right, as you put the threshold up, then the, uh, you, you're raising the bar. So now I'm going to move it. So, so what I've just covered there is, is global thresholding method. These are methods where we apply one threshold across the whole, whole network. So all edges are treated in the same way. In some networks, we might see that particular parts of the network, particular communities, particular sets of edges, might be overall very highly connected. They have very high edge weights, where the other parts of the communities, in general, have a, a lower edge weight. So if we apply a global threshold, that community with an overall low weight is going to be removed, whereas the high is going to remain. So we might want to tailor our threshold to the particular parts of the particular locales of the network. One way of doing that, so one uh, thresholding method is called the disparity filter. Uh, the way the disparity filter works is we essentially, I'll, I'll describe it to you with an example. So in this example, we only have uh, two nodes that have degree greater than one. And so basically we consider each node of the network independently. So each node that has a degree greater than one, so if it has more than one connection, we consider that node separately. So in this case, we would break the network into two parts. The part uh, associated with the red node and the part associated with the uh, green node. And what we do, we normalize the edge weights um, so, for example, the yellow uh, normalized weight here is just taking 10 divided by 10, 11, 12, 13 by the sum of the edge weights out of the red node. We can do that for all of the other um, nodes on the red. So, for example, the 0.08 is just 1 divided by 13 and so on. We can do the same thing for the green node, right? We can take uh, the value of 1 and divide it by 1 plus 1 plus 0.1 plus 0.1 to get the, the corresponding value. And then what we do for each node, so if we start with the red node, we say, if we were to take a, a one meter ruler, we take a one meter ruler, and if we were to make three cuts in that ruler at random positions, so in other words, if we make three cuts, we end up with four segments. And the question we ask, so for example, if we want to say, do we keep the edge with weight 0.77, or do we threshold this edge away, we say, what's the probability that one of those, or the, the, the longest cut in our ruler is of length that is greater than 77 centimeters? So that's the edge weight on that uh, thing, on, on that edge. And if we say that finding a, a, if we chop the ruler up into four pieces and we don't find, or we find very few edges that are, that are greater than 77 centimeters, we say we keep that edge. And it, I mean, you can imagine if you chop a ruler up into three, you make three cuts in a, in a ruler around it, it's going to be pretty rare that you find a, a length that's 77 centimetres, right? In contrast, with these ones, to find a length that's greater than eight centimetres, 
you're probably going to find many cases where, where that happens. Um, so in this way we can threshold the graph as such, so we can repeat that procedure for the green node as well, and this is what happens in the threshold of graph. The key point to note here is, is that we see for the red node, this edge of 1 is thresholded away, right? It's gone here. In contrast, with this relative to the green node, this edge of 1 is, is maintained, because that's in this locale, the locale of the, of the green node, the weights are generally quite small. We have 1, 1 and 0.1. Whereas in contrast, in, with the red node, we have this very high weight, which is pushing up our expectations. So this is an example where we can threshold within uh, particular locations based on the, on the overall weight within uh, the location of the network. Um, one of the issues that comes about with any of these thresholding methods is a network fragmentation. So if we threshold uh, very severely, it's likely, in fact, it becomes inevitable that our network will break up into different components. So here I've shown where I threshold in such a way that the network breaks up into three distinct components. So I've got a red, green, and a blue. The problem with this approach is that um, if you then go on to perform subsequent graph analyses, they can be confounded or they can be quite difficult in a, in a fragmented network. So, for example, if you wanted to find the path between the green and the red component, there is actually no path between them. So the, the notion of a path becomes um, not very well defined in a network that's fragmented. So in general, we would want to perform thresholding in such a way that ensures the thresholded graph remains connected. We don't have any isolated components um, in the graph. One way around doing that is to perform thresholding based on something known as a minimum spanning tree. Um, the minimum spanning tree is a set of edges, the, the, the smallest subset of edges that ensures all of the nodes in the network are connected. Um, if you think about it for long enough, you'll see that in an MST, the number of edges is always one, uh, the number of nodes minus one. So if I have a graph that comprises 10 edges, the minimum spanning tree will always comprise nine edges, one less of the nodes. So you can see here um, that the basic approach of this thresholding of this thresholding strategy based on the MST. We start with the unthresholded graph. We find the MST. I'll discuss in a moment how we go about finding the MST. Once we have the MST, this gives us a kind of backbone that ensures all the nodes in the network are connected. So in other words, we can find a path between any pair of nodes in our threshold, in, in our MST. That's by definition of the MST. And then we can add, once we have the MST, we can then add further edges until we get to a desired connection density, until we get to a desired number of edges. And there's various ways of doing that. We could just add in the next strong. So once we have the MST, we could then add the next strongest edges to the MST to continue, progressively add the next strongest edges until we get to, a, to, a, uh, to the required connection um, density. So one of the advanced exercises in this afternoon's prac will be to, um, to implement the MST and MST thresholding method. And so to do that, you'll need to implement a method to generate an MST. So here I've given you the details of a very, uh, very simple method to find a, 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 an MST in a graph. It's referred to as Kruskal's um, algorithm. Uh, it's actually quite simple to understand, so I'll present it in terms of an example. So I'll consider the, the graph that I've shown there in the upper, upper right. It's a small graph. And the idea here is that we want to find the minimum uh, spanning tree for this graph. One uh, key point that, that I've missed is that in um, brain networks, in chronic timings, we're usually interested in keeping the edges with the highest edge weights. They're generally the the edges that have the, for example, edges that have the strongest correlation, or the edges that have the uh, highest streamlined count, these are the edges that we want to keep in our threshold graph. 
So a minimum spanning tree will actually do the opposite. It usually wants to keep the low weight edges. So we have to do some kind of transform to make the biggest edges the smallest and the smallest edges the, the biggest. In an MST, uh, one way to do this is rather than looking at the smallest, one way is that we can just negate the edges and so make all the edges negative. Another way is, is that we just, rather than looking at a minimum spanning tree, we can sort of think of it as a maximum spanning tree. So we have the edges with the highest weight. Uh, it's a subtlety that's, I guess it's not too important in this. It'll come up also in path lengths as well. So what we do, when we want to find the MST of this, we say, okay, we start with the empty graph. So we have our, our, uh, our one, two, three, four, our five nodes. And we say, how many uh, components are there in this graph? And so in this graph, we have five. Each of the five nodes corresponds to a, a component. Then we look at the graph and we take the strongest edge. And the strongest edge, we could either choose the three between these two nodes or this one here. In this case, I've chosen the one between these two nodes. I add that edge to the MST. And then I say, how many connected components do I have at step two? And I have one, two, three, four, right? This is now, because there's a path between the two, this forms a connected component. And therefore, the number of connected components has been reduced to five to four. Because the number has reduced, I keep that edge in. Then I go to the next step, step three. I say, okay, what's the next strongest edge? That's this one here. I add it into the graph. And then I compute the number of connected components. I have one, so one, two, and three. So the number of connected components has been reduced from step two to three. I've gone from four to three. So I keep that edge as well. Next step, I say, what's the next strongest edge? Well, it's this edge here between these two nodes. It's the edge with weight two. I add that in. Uh, and then I say, how many connected components do I have? I've got one, two, three. Now I note that the number of connected components hasn't reduced from step three to four, and therefore I don't keep that edge. I have to throw this edge away because this edge is not resulting in a reduction in the number of connected components. So I throw this edge away, don't worry about that ever again, and then I go to the next strongest edge, which is one, and then it'll be the one after that. And I, that's my minimum spanning tree. So the key point of this is we keep adding the strongest edges. When we add an edge, we make sure that the number of connected components reduces is reduced by one compared to the previous step. If it is reduced by one, we keep the edge. If it is not reduced by one, we throw that edge away and we look for the next strongest edge. Yep. Uh, it's a computational cost if it's a player, if the number of nodes is higher. I yep. mean, because for each step, go to the next step, we need yep. 10 minus 1 comparison. Yep. So in the statistics here, so we have large so, so the, the, the computational, this is not the most computationally efficient way to find an MST. There are other algorithms that are uh, less computationally expensive. The reason why we've used this is just for simplicity in terms of programming this. Uh, for the, the, the graphs that we consider here of 100 or a couple of hundred nodes, this can be done relatively quickly. But you're absolutely right. I mean, if we have a graph with thousands, tens of thousands of nodes, this would be very slow. Time order of this would be and so I think. Yes, it's not the most efficient way to, to there's more efficient ways of, uh, with, with, with a lower compute computational complexity. I guess the, the advantage of this is that it's quite simple to to code up and that's the the main reason that we've, we've chosen this. Okay, so one of the last methods, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, is multi-resolution methods. So this is another local thresholding method. The basic strategy here is, is that rather than setting a one threshold, we actually set a lower and an upper bound. And so we only keep weights that are within a lower and an upper threshold. So I've denoted that here with tau one and tau two. And so we build a network based on the edges just within this range. We analyze its properties and then we can slide this window along a little more and we can build a graph based on another range. And so we can look at um, 
really the multi-resolution structure of a network, so the, the structure for a high, very high edge weights, for a moderate and, and low edge weights. So this is popular in, in, uh, in chronic tummy syndrome, a, a, a couple of one paper that's, that's, that's looked at this. Uh, we won't look at this in the prep uh, either. So the question is, I've presented a lot of thresholding methods and different ways of thresholding a graph. So you might be asking, you know, being introduced to all these methods. So what's the actual method that you should use in your uh, own study? So you can conduct a connect on study. How should you threshold uh, your graphs? And there's not really one answer to that. It really depends on the type of analysis that you are doing. Um, the first thing to note is that thresholding and binarization are not essential steps. So you can perform analysis on an unthresholded graph. Uh, there are, most of the uh, network functions can be performed on, on weighted networks. Uh, there's no need to binarize, but of course, as I've already mentioned, there are some uh, important advantages that can be gained by threshold and, and, and binarizing a graph. Um, the two most widely used methods are density and weight-based weight thresholding. If you're only interested in analyzing one subject, these are essentially the same method. So if you give me a, a weight threshold, I can give you a connection density as a one-to-one -one mapping. If you're doing uh, group studies, um, the disadvantage of weight-based thresholding is that you can have differences in the number of edges between individuals, and this, this can introduce a confound in further graph analysis. Uh, the disadvantage of density-based thresholding is that in the group that might have overall lower connectivity, there's a greater risk that you're introducing spurious connections in there, so you're lowering the bar to account for the fact that connectivity is overall lower if we might be introducing some spurious connections just for the sake of ensuring that they have the same number of edges across subjects. And finally, if you're interested in particular in, in heterogeneity across the network or particular parts of the network, you might want to give consideration to local uh, thresholding uh, methods. So, are there any questions before I move on to nodes? Is there any questions about thresholding um, before I move on, I should I go straight on to um, no degree? No, okay, I'll, uh, I'll move on to characterizing no degree. So, once you've, you've mapped your connect time, um, you've applied a thresholding technique, whether that be weight or density based thresholding. One of the most simplest things that you can characterize in brain network is node degree. Um, it can provide important information about the function of a node. Uh, it can be used to determine whether a node is a hub node, so it's, it's an integrator of information, or whether it's more of a peripheral node that resides within a, a module and it's associated with a more specialized uh, uh, function. And no, can re no degree, or as it's known as strength in, in, in a weighted network, can be can come in different flavors. And I'll give you, depending on whether the graph is binary, weighted, or directed, or directed and, and, and weighted. So I'll give you the, I'll begin with the basic uh, definitions. So in a binary graph, the degree is, is, is really easy to understand. All that it is, it's the number of, so for a given node i, it's the number of other nodes to which that node is directly connected. So in this case, node I has three uh, connections, it's connected to three other neighbors, and therefore its degree is three. Uh, to compute the degree based on the connectivity matrix for a given node, as uh, Alex already alluded to this morning, it's really just a matter of computing the, either the row sum or the column sum. So in this case, A denotes our connectivity matrix. So this could be our thresholded um, matrix. And if we wanted to compute the degree of node I, we simply sum along the columns of row I of our connectivity matrix. Um, because this matrix is symmetric about the diagonal, we could also sum along the rows of column I, we get this same the same results. So it doesn't matter in the case of a, of a binary undirected matrix whether we sum across the rows or the, or the columns. Um, from a practical perspective, when you're computing degree in the 
crack exercise, remember to make sure that the diagonal, I think in the matrices that we give you, the diagonal has been set to zero, but some, if you map a functional connectivity matrix, by default the diagonal will be one. So before computing degrees, it's important to set that diagonal to a value of zero, otherwise you're gonna uh, increment the, the actual degree of every node by a value of, of one. It's gonna count that diagonal. In a weighted graph, um, we can, we, rather than talking of a node degree, we refer to node strength, which is the, the analogous um, uh, concept. And so here I've shown a, a, a node, I, which is connected to three other nodes. These are the weights of the edges outgoing from node I, and the strength is just the sum across those three weights. And in that case, it's the same, computing the weight degree is the same, we sum across so if we want to compute the, the strength of node i, we sum across, um, we, we consider rho i, and we sum across the, the columns of the strength it needs. So in this case, this would be a matrix with ones and zeros. In this case, this would be a matrix with zeros and continuous uh, values. So that's pretty uh, straightforward. We can also define the case, in the case of directed networks, we have the notion of an in-degree and an out-degree. So remember in directed networks, now the edges have um, directions on them. So we can have nodes, we can have nodes that have uh, edges that come, that are outgoing, and we can also have edges that are ingoing to the particular node. Uh, so in this case, node I has an in-degree of one and has an out-degree of two. So it's just counting the number of, of outgoing and ingoing edges. Um, once again, if we have, if we adopt the convention that element A, so in this case, in the case of a directed network, the network now is not necessarily symmetric about the diagonal. Um, so it's going to depend. So if we sum across the rows, we're not going to get necessarily the same results as if we sum across the, the columns. So if we adopt the convention that AIJ is the connection from node J to I, we can compute the in-degree by summing across, so if we want to compute the in-degree for node i, we sum across the columns, we sum across the j. In contrast, if we want to compute the out-degree, we sum across the rows of column, column i. So remember, that, as I said, that for a directed matrix, we don't have the symmetry, so summing across rows and columns is going to give us a different result. We can also extend this definition of an in-degree and an out-degree for, for a directed, for a weighted and a directed network. I haven't shown the generalization here, but it's the obvious way to generalize this. We can have an in-strength and an out, uh, and an out-strength. So here's a further example. I think Alex has already presented this. So for the case, I'll, I'll go to this really quick. For an undirected network, if we want to compute the degree of uh, of node C, we can either sum across the row, uh, sorry, we can sum across the column, or we can sum across the row. So we have a degree of three, it's connected to three other nodes. So we have one, two, three, one, two, three, it gives us the same result. In contrast with a directed network, if we're interested in the, um, the in degree of node uh, C, node C has an in degree of two, Therefore, we sum across the columns, we get one and two. If we're interested in the out degree, we have the out degree there, which is also two. We sum across the rows. Um, it's important, some, some uh, texts will actually use the opposite con convention that AIJ is the connection from I to J. So keep, be aware of the convention that's used in the, in the paper or the text that you're, uh, that you're looking at it's not always the same, that AIJ is, is the connection from, from J to, to I. So one of the uh, key um, facts about, it, about brain networks and, and networks in general is that there's great heterogeneity in the degree of nodes across a network. So we know that some nodes uh, have very high degree, so these are referred to as hub nodes. These are the nodes colored here in, in uh, red. By the way, this is a cat connectome uh, that was uh, generated by uh, Vanderbilt, Martin Vanderbilt. You can see here the basic structure of modules. We 
have the hub nodes here. So the hub nodes are the integrators of information and a key marker of a hub is that it has a high degree. So it has many, it connects with, it directly connects with many other nodes um, in, in the network. We also have, uh, which can also be deduced from degrees, peripheral nodes that sit out here in, in the modules these typically have a lower degree and they're more likely to be associated with a specialized function. And so by studying the degree distribution, we can get a handle on whether our network has hubs, how many hubs it might have, and uh, the function of these uh, particular, uh, of these modes. So really there's, um, I mean, how would you go about this? Once, you've, once you have your um, once you've mapped the node, or you've, you've computed the node, the, the, the degree of every node in your network, you're going to have a long list of, of nodes. So if your network has, say, 100 nodes, you can compute the degree of each node, and that's going to give you what's referred to as a degree sequence. So for every node, you'll have a value 10, 15, 35, and so on. So as many nodes as in your network, you're going to get a, a, a list of, of, of degrees. And the question is, how can you, um, how can you, can you, uh, how can you cut, sorry, my microphone's. So the question is, how can you characterize this, uh, how can you, is that, yeah, it's better. So how can you characterize um, a degree sequence? What's the different ways that you could characterize uh, a sequence of degrees? And, and the simplest way is to use the, the PDF, the probability density function. And the PDF is just saying if I choose arbitrarily, so if I have my, my list of degrees, if I go in there and choose one of the degrees at random, what's the probability that that degree is of one or if that degree is of two or so on? So I've given an example here of a PDF. So this is my degree sequence in my network. I've measured nodes of degree 2, 2, 3, 2, 2, and 1. If I go in and choose, if I'm interested in a node of degree 1 to compute the PDF, I say, well, I've got one instance of a 1. In total, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And so my uh, density or the probability that I find a node of degree 1 is simply 1 on 6. The probability that I find a node, if I arbitrarily choose a node for my degree sequence, the probability that's of degree 2 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 on 6. Um, so to compute the PDF, you're just counting the number of times, the number of instances that you find a degree of that value in your, uh, in your list of degrees. And of course you can plot a Density, I've shown that here as a, as a degree density. A more informative way to characterize degree is using the CDF and the complementary CDF, so the cumulative distribution function. The cumulative distribution function is telling us if I choose a random node, I choose arbitrarily choose a node from my network, What's the probability that that node is of degree that is less than or equal to k? Um, so I go in, choose a node, might be a node of, of degree 15. Um, <coughs> what's the probability? So you know, what's the probability that it is, is less than, than 15? Uh, and so to compute that, we uh, can simply rank our nodes from smallest to largest. So this is the example here where I've ranked the nodes from smallest to the smallest degree is one. I've ranked them up to degree three. And if I want to compute the CDF for a value of zero, so what's the probability that a degree is less than zero? I actually find no edges, no nodes with a degree zero, and therefore that probability is zero. If I go to one, this is the first ranked element. So the probability that the degree is less than one is one on six. If I go to uh, the degree of two, I, so, I, I look and I say, what's the maximum rank of a node with degree two? So the maximum is this one here. This has a rank of one, two, three, four, five. And therefore my CDF is five on six. So the probability of 
if I choose a, a, a random node, it has a, there's a five on six chance that its degree will be less or equal to two. So in summary, if you want to find the CDF, all that you do is you rank your nodes from smallest to largest, and if you're so if you're interested in a value of two, you find the node that has maximum rank. So in this case, the maximum rank of a node two is one, two, three, four, five. Five divided by six is the value of the, of the CDF. In uh, networks, we're often interested in the tail of the distribution. So we're interested in the, in the complementary CDF. The complementary CDF is nothing but the one minus the, the CDF. So once we have the uh, CDF, the CDF is this thing here. If we, if we do one minus the CDF, that gives us the complementary CDF. So the complementary CDF is what's the probability we choose an arbitrary node that is it's of degree greater than uh, greater than k. The reason that we're interested in the complementary CDF is that it emphasises the tail of the distribution. Uh, the tail of the by the tail of the distribution, I mean the high degree nodes. Uh, it's the high degree nodes that correspond to the hubs, and this is what we're uh, interested in, uh, in characterising. And so, once you have the CDF, it's very easy, easy, easy to com compute the complementary CDF. You just do one minus that, and that will give you the, the complementary CDF. So, once you've done this, once you have the, the CDF and the complementary CDF, you can test whether your empirical network uh, displays a degree distribution that matches particular candidate distributions, particular classes of degree distributions. So there's really three very broad classes of degree distributions in networks. I'm going to very briefly go through those um, now. And what's typically done is that as a first step in connectomics is that once you have your, once you've mapped your, your connectome and you have your uh, no degrees in your C and you've computed your CDF, the idea is to see which of these three broad classes best explains your, um, your connectome, your actual uh, degree distribution. So the first class of degree distribution is referred to a single scale, uh, as a single scale distribution. And this distribution lacks hubs, there's no hubs in these networks. Um, Typically, we have that the degree is centered around a, a modal value. So we see that you know, the modal value might be 4, and most of the degrees are centered around that value of 4. We don't have any, so if you look here at the probability density function, the probability of finding very high degree nodes is extremely small, right? There's no probability mass located anywhere here. So the probability of finding a node of degree 100 or 150 is, is essentially zero. We see that all of the uh, probability mass is, is essentially under values of 50. So we generally have um, very low, uh, uh, most of the, of the nodes are very low degree. Uh, we also see that in the complementary CDF, we see this uh, very quick, very rapid uh, uh, decay of the tail. So the tail is referred to as this end of the, the CDF. So a candidate distribution of a single scale um, is, is, the, uh, is the exponential distribution. So I've given you here the PDF of the exponential distribution where lambda is a parameter to be fitted and I've also given you the CDF of the exponential um, distribution. One thing to note, if you have, say for example, if you've mapped your connectome and you want to test whether your degree distribution is a good fit to an exponential, what you can do is that you can take the, if you take the logarithm of both sides of this equation, you see that the logarithm of the complementary CDF is nothing but minus lambda on k. So what you would see if you plot the logarithm of the y-axis, so if you use log on the y-axis, and if you plot this on a linear axis, you should see that the complementary CDF is a straight line, right? Because it's only dependent on, I mean, this is an equation for a straight line. You have the log of the, the uh, probability, and then you have minus lambda k. So on a, on a log distribution, when the y-axis is log distributed, 
it is log scale and the x-axis is linear scale, if it's an exponential distribution, you should see a straight line. Um, and this means that you can also fit this using methods such as least squares. So if you want to compute the parameter of lambda, you can use least squares fitting. Another class of degree distributions is scale-free, uh, is a scale-free distribution. And with a scale-free, you see that there's a lot higher probability that you find very high degree nodes. So in this case, there's, you have, uh, I mean, while the, the probability of finding high degree nodes is lower than what you see very low, you still have quite a substantial probability of finding high degree nodes. Um, and this is referred to the fact that there's no characteristic scale. So in the previous distribution, you would generally have that the nodes would be, would be distributed around a mean or a modal value. In this case, there's no mean or modal um, <coughs> value, so it can extend to very high degrees. And so a scale-free, the, the, the characteristic scale-free distribution is a power law. So I've given you once again here the uh, density, the PDF for a power law as well as the CDF for a power law. How would you diagnose power law behavior in your, if you, if you measure your degree sequence and you compute the CDF? Uh, what you can see is that if you take the log, the logarithm of both sides of this equation, you see that the logarithm is, so you do this log C minus, so that, remember the gamma will come to the front once you take the log, you have minus gamma log k. So if you plot the, um, the, the, the complementary CDF on a logarithmic scale on both the y-axis and the x-axis, you end up with a straight line. So a very simple or preliminary way to diagnose the scale-free distribution is that if you plot the complementary CDF on doubly logarithmic axes, so both the x-axis and the y-axis is log scale, then you end up with a straight line on the log-log axis. And that's because if you take the log of this and the log of this, you end up with log k here, and the, the y is, is log k. So that's a very simple test for, for, um, for power law scaling in your degree uh, distribution. Uh, the final class of networks is referred to as broad scale. So this is where you have uh, power law scaling over a limited range of degrees. But in many of these real world systems, including the brain, there's, uh, there's constraints on how big the network can grow. So you can't get nodes of arbitrary degree because the brain's confined to, the, to a limited space. It sits inside the, 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 the head and this can't be arbitrarily big. So you generally get power law scaling over a given range of degrees. But once you hit a certain threshold, then you end up having a tail off. Um, and in this case, we can measure this as an exponential. So this kind of tail off, refer to this as a truncation. And one way to do this is with an exponential um, truncation. So you see here um, that you have a power law. This is essentially the power law. But once you get to a certain threshold, the exponential begins to kick in. And it begins to cause the power law or the tail of the power law to drop off. So while you still get some high degree nodes, you don't get as many high degrees as what you would get in a pure power law or a pure scale free distribution. So you can see this tail off in the CCDF. So in summary, um, this, the three broad classes of degree distributions, the single scale, this is where the nodes are, this is where the degrees are distributed around a mean value. A mean value. We have power law. This is the case where we have some very high degree nodes, hub nodes. And then there's the broad scale where we have a power law over a limited range. And so typically what we want to do is want to, once we've mapped a, a network and node, we want to see which of these three best fits um, our, our empirical degree distribution. So in real brain networks, these are some results of doing this approach in empirical brain networks that have been mapped. Uh, a lot of the early work suggested that the brain networks were power law distributed. Uh, more recent work has shown that they are actually exponentially truncated, so they're power law up to a given degree, but because the brain is limited in size, you see this truncation point, and the network can't have arbitrarily large degrees. So in all of these 
these are once again log log, and you can sort of see this truncation point in a lot of the plots where the straight line begins to uh, decay. Um, in the interest of time, I'll go through this pretty quick. One way to determine, so if you want to, a very preliminary way is, as I've said, if you want to test for a power law, the CCDF will be a straight line on a log log distribution. You might also want to determine the parameters of the fit. So remember, these the distributions are characterized, the exponential by a lambda, um, the power law has the gap, the exponent of the power law, and also this constant c. So you can use least squares so, uh, to, to fit these parameters. Uh, but this has some limitations, and so there are alternative approaches uh, for fitting. Uh, one is the approach that has been developed by uh, Closet um, quite, <coughs> quite, quite, excuse me, quite a while ago. This is a standard in the field, uh, basically using maximum likelihood estimation to estimate the exponent. I'm not going to go through the details of this. If you're interested, um, I'm happy to chat with you about the details of MLE estimation for a power law. The, what I would say though, the disadvantage, or one of the disadvantages of this, it's quite, if, if you have, so we know that in brain networks, it would seem that most brain networks are exponentially truncated power laws. To use this, while this works very well for a pure power law, for an exponentially truncated power law, it's quite tough to, it's quite difficult to do <coughs> this um, approach. Um, and this just uh, outlines those limitations. So one of the biggest limitations of, of fitting a, de a candidate de degree distribution is that uh, in brain networks we generally only have a limited range of degrees. So if we have 100 nodes, we only really have two orders of magnitude. So remember we're, we're sort of we're plotting this as a function of, of, of the log, so we're interested in saying 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000. Uh, in brain networks we only have generally 100, it's very rare that we have over 1,000 nodes in our network. So we don't have a sufficient uh, range of uh, orders of magnitude to make a really robust and reliable estimation. With least squares fitting, the assumption is, is that, the, that, that the observations in the CCDF are independent, when in fact we know that they're not, and I've given some limitations there of MLE, which I won't go through um, here. One of the key things to note though, so, that, so what, with all of these approaches is that we assume that a hub is a node that is connected, that is directly connected to many other nodes. Uh, as we'll see tomorrow, as Alex will discuss, this, is, this can be a, a rather uh, a limited view of, of a hub. So you can consider this node here, this red node, and you could ask, is this, is this a hub? Is this red node a, a hub in this network? And by our definition of degree, if we just count the number of neighbors to which this red node is connected, it's connected to two, it's, it's not a hub, right? There's many other nodes in this network that are of higher degree. So this, net, this node has a degree of uh, three, this node has a degree of four. So if anything, this would be uh, more of a hub. But you could imagine that if any of these nodes here want to communicate with the nodes here, they must pass through this red node. So this red node is going to receive a lot of traffic that's flowing between these two components of that network. And on this basis, you might argue that the red node is in fact, or perhaps it's not a hub, but it's, a, it's definitely an important uh, part. It's an important transit point of the network. And so there are alternative ways to characterize the importance of nodes that are, are more sophisticated than just counting the number of uh, nodes to which the, that node is directly connected. So these are measures such as betweenness, uh, centrality that, uh, we'll, that, that Alex will discuss tomorrow. So that's just a caveat when you're considering the node. Remember that the node degree is a fairly uh, limited way of characterizing the importance of a node in, uh, in, net, in a network. So I'm now going to move on to the last part <coughs> of, of this lecture. This is really about studying um, paths and, and communication um, in a network. So a network really serves to enable different network elements to communicate with each other. So we have a node that might be in one part of the brain, the occipital cortex, and another node in the frontal part, and they might want to send information between each other. And 
the, the basic assumption is that that information would traverse uh, fiber bundles, axons within the brain, uh, so that this kind of uh, this uh, path through the through the network enables signaling to, to uh, between the two between the two nodes. The question is though is how do these signals propagate? What are the edges? What are the nodes that they traverse on? So in the simple case, those two nodes might be directly connected by a fiber bundle, by an axon. In that case, it's pretty trivial, right? That they're just the information <coughs> would flow on that direct connection. Other pairs of nodes might not have a direct connection. They might only be connected by an indirect route or via another node. And so the information might first have to flow to an intermediate node. Once it reaches that intermediate node, it's then routed on to, a, to the desired destination. So this would represent a path in the network. And you can envisage even more complex scenarios where there might be multiple intermediary nodes that, are, that, are, that information needs to flow through before it gets to its desired destination. And paths is one of the simplest ways to characterize the, the flow of information uh, in a graph. So I'll first of all introduce some of the basic definitions that relate to a path. There's really three key definitions. There's a walk, and I'll illustrate these with an example. So a walk is really a sequence of edges and nodes and that sequence of edges can traverse the same edge or the same node on multiple occasions. So here you see that I go from node A, then I go to C, D, B, and I do a loop, I go around and then I go to my destination E. So I've traversed multiple edges on multiple occasions and I've traversed the same node on many, many nodes on, the, uh, on, on, my, uh, on my walk through the network. So walks are probably not so relevant in uh, brain networks. It's unlikely, or it's a, it's a very inefficient way to, to route information. You wouldn't expect that information would start at a given node, get to C, and then do a loop, and then come back to another node. Why, what, what would be the, you know, what's the, the advantage of looping over the same set of nodes or edges? So walks are probably not that relevant to, to neuroscience. You can also consider trails. A trail, is a walk that doesn't traverse the same edge more than once. So in this case here, we see that we traverse the same node, namely node B more than once. So I go along here, and then I go back to B. But there's no edge here in this network that I traverse more than once. So a, um, a trail is a little bit more realistic in what we would expect uh, to be a, a, a route by which information would, throw, would flow in the brain. But you could also argue why would information traverse the same node more than once. So the most, probably the most relevant to neuroscience is a path. And a path is simply a trail that doesn't traverse the, any, any node more than once. So in other words, a path is, is, a, is a sequence of edges that doesn't include the same node or the same edge more than once. So you see that here, there's no node or edge that's traversed more than once. It's also important, and this is a little obvious, but a path is always defined with respect to a sort with a with, with respect to a pair of nodes. And in a directed network, we can define a path such that it goes from a source to a target. In an undirected network, we don't have a notion of a, of a, of a source and a target. We just have a pair of a pair of nodes between which the path is is defined. In uh, connectomics. The basic assumption is that information is routed along the shortest paths in the networks. So not only are we interested in paths, we're specifically interested in the shortest paths between a pair of nodes. And to define the shortest paths, we need to define the concept of path length. Uh, path length is a very simple concept in a, in a binary network the path length is just the number of edges that are traversed between a pair of nodes. So if, I'm, if I traverse two edges, so if I go from node A to B, and I go to via a, 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 an intermediary node, so I go A to C, C to B, my path length is two, so because I've gone through two hops, I've traversed two edges. Um, in weighted networks, the path length is the sum of the weights 
along the edges that I traverse. So if I was to traverse this path that's shown in green, <coughs> the shortest path is given by 5 plus 1 plus 1, which is 7. So my path length is 7. Um, I've shown there that green path, by the way, is also the shortest path in the network. So the shortest path is the network that has the lowest path length. So if I'm interested in finding the shortest path between node A and F, there's no other path from A to F that achieves a path that is lower than, than 7. So the green uh, path here corresponds to the shortest path in the network. And most of neuroscience, most of connectomics today has focused on characterizing the shortest paths uh, in a network. You might ask why shortest paths? Why specifically will we look at a model <coughs> Um, of information flow that's constrained, that's limited to the shortest path of the network. And there's several reasons for that. One of the reasons that I haven't listed here is that most of the uh, tools in graph theory that have been developed before connect timings have focused on shortest paths. So if you're interested in engineering networks, telecoms networks, it's always the shortest path that are of most, uh, of most utility. So it's probably just what we borrow from, from other fields. But there are other reasons in neuroscience for doing that as well. Uh, shortest paths minimize conduction delays. They minimize the energy. So transmitting information is, is metabolically costly. So there's no reason to transmit information over long routes when we have a direct route between a, a source and a, and a target. So that direct route would correspond to a shortest path. And we also know that there's some phase validity to this in the sense that the shortest paths are a reasonable predictor of functional connectivity. So if we have a pair of nodes, and if we compute the shortest path length in a structural network, in a diffusion MRI network, and we compute and we compare that path length to the functional connectivity between those two nodes, there's generally a, a, a reasonable uh, correlation between structure and function. In fact, Alex showed some of the scatter plots of these in this morning's uh, lecture. Uh, one of the criticisms of the shortest paths, though, is that we need global information of the network. So if you want to find the shortest path in a network, if I'm in a given node, if I'm at this node here, and I want to find the shortest path to this node here, I need to know the information, I need to know the edge weights of all other edges in this network to be able to guarantee that I can find the shortest path between this node and, and this node. And this might be an unrealistic assumption. It's, it's probably unlikely that a given node in a brain network is aware of the edge weights across all other axons in, in the brain. So perhaps this is, a, is an unrealistic assumption. So how do we compute shortest paths? A key point is, is that we first need to remap the edge weights. So I mentioned this before in terms of the MST. Here it becomes even more important. Remember, with most connectome mapping techniques, edges <coughs> Uh, are mapped in such a way that high edges, so edges with a high edge weight, are the most reliable and the strongest connections. These are the connections on which we want our shortest paths to traverse. In contrast, shortest paths are interest, uh, 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 by definition uh, wanting to traverse the lowest edge weights. So what we need to do is we need to first remap our edges such that the highest edge weights become the lowest and the lowest become the highest. And a very simple way to remap that is with this reciprocal or inverse remapping where we simply, once, we've, once we have our threshold of network, so we map our connectome, we threshold that network, and then of the remaining weights, we take one on. So the big weights become small and the small weights become big. And this then allows us to define shortest paths in a, in a meaningful way. And I've given an example of that here. So this is our original network. So you could consider these to be the, the streamline counts. The number of streamlines that we found between A and B was 20 and 100. So these ones with 100 are the reliable, the strong connections that we want the shortest paths to go on. So what we do, we remap these by taking one on the weight. And in this case, I've just multiplied it by 100 to make the numbers easy to, to, for simplicity, uh, it's not necessary yet, need to multiply them by 100. And we end up with these connections here, and we see that the shortest path goes from five, this one to this one, along this sequence of edges, 
And if you look at here, you see that these are the strongest edges. It's the 100 and the 100. So it's generally traversing the strong, um, the edges that have strong weights. So this is a critical point. It's don't, it, it doesn't make sense to compute shortest paths on the raw uh, functional connectivity matrices or on the raw stream layout. You, know, so you need to first do it, uh, uh, to, to remap them in such a way that the Largest edge weights become the smallest, and the smallest become the largest. Is that does that make sense? Are there any queries regarding the remap? Yeah. So is it pretty typical then that uh, there's a preprocessing step that has this flip because it sounds like the minimum spanning tree we need this type of thing? Yeah. Yes. So there's a, there are preprocessed. There's a, there's actually different ways of doing. So what I've shown here is one potential remapping. There are other remappings that can be um, performed to to achieve the same uh, to achieve the same uh, for the same purpose. Um, so there are functions in DCT that can perform this. Um, you can also implement it quite easily in um, that too. It's just a one on yeah, one on the, on the matrix. Um, so once you have your once you've performed this uh, remapping, once you've remapped the edge weights, the question is how can you compute the shortest paths in the graph? And there's various algorithms for doing this. One of the most well-known one is uh, Dijkstra's algorithm. So Dijkstra's algorithm will only work if you don't have any negative edge weights in your network. If you have negative edge weights, it, it can fail, and it usually does fail. So it's important to, if you have negative edge weights, you should set a threshold. You should, when you perform your graph thresholding, you should set a threshold such that the negative weights are eliminated from the graph. Um, another way of doing it, you might take the absolute value of the edges so that the negative edges become positive. But then there's a question of you know, if you make a, a, a negative edge positive, you're essentially saying that a very negative edge has the same purpose as a very uh, as a positive edge. It's the same biological interpretation, that might not always be the case. So that's something that needs to be given thought as to how to deal with, with negative, uh, negative edges. Um, I'll briefly walk through Dijkstra's algorithm. In the practical exercises, you don't need to, you'll be just using Dijkstra as a, as a black box. You don't need to program this yourself. Uh, I'll go through this briefly. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to, to sit down with you and describe it, the algorithm later on. Basically, you start with, uh, so in this example, we want to find the shortest path between this node, between node A and node F. They're the two nodes that we're interested in. And I've given on each of the edges the remapped edge weights. And the way that we initialize Dijkstra's algorithm is that we, for every node, so we have, we'll have this notion of a visited versus an unvisited node. Initially, all of the nodes are unvisited. So all of the nodes are marked as grey. Once a node is visited, it turns to blue. Uh, we also initialize each of the nodes with a cost, which is essentially the path length of that node. So initially, the cost to all nodes is infinite. So we have an infinite um, uh, cost to all, or an infinite path length to all other nodes. And we also have this matrix here, which tells us the preceding node to, from how we got to that, to that particular. So for example, A, A is, tells us if we're at node A, how did we get to node A? It'll become clear as I describe the step. So the first thing is we started out our source, our source is step two, so we mark that as a visited node. We give that a cost of zero, because that's the node that we're starting from. And we look at its two neighbors. So the two no neighbors of node A are node B and node C, and we assign a cost to them. So we can say to go from zero to node B, it's a cost of five. To go from zero to C, it's a cost of one. So we put five and one here in these two nodes. And then we choose, and then we mark that node as visited, so it becomes as blue. And then we say, what's the next node that we're going to visit? So we visit at node A. The next node to visit is the node with the lowest cost, with the lowest um, path length to it currently. And so that is this node here, this node one. Node one is less than five, so we visit this. And we say, okay, we have this node here. Where can we go to? We can go 
Well, the only place that we can go to is node uh, is node e. So we say that we give this a, a new cost rather than being infinite in the previous step. Now it becomes ten plus one, so it becomes a cost of eleven. And then we mark this node as visited. So node C is, becomes blue because that's a node that we've just visited and we can never visit that node again. That cost, therefore, is fixed. The cost there is one. The nodes that are not visited, these costs can change. We then say, okay, what's the, um, what's the minimum? The minimum current cost, and that is node five. So we then visit uh, node five, which is here. So we mark that as visited. We say what's its neighbours? Its neighbours are node six. Uh, sorry, it's node node D and node E. And then this is the important point. We see that when we get to node five, if we want to go to node E, the current cost at node E is eleven, right? However, if we're at node because currently we got to node uh, this node here via node C. When we visit node 5, we see that, well, hey, look at this. We can now go from to, to this node here by this link here, and the cost will be 5 plus 1, which is 6, which is less than, than the 11. So what we do, we update the cost of this node here, and we give this a cost of, of 6. So that's a key point of Dijkstra's algorithm. A node that hasn't been visited yet can have its cost uh, updated. It can be lowered. And we keep going with this uh, process, so then we say that this node is, then we take the next uh, lowest uh, weight that hasn't been unvisited, which is this one here, node 6. We say, what's its neighbours? Well, it has uh, this neighbour here. Um, and also, well, we could go down here, but if we do 6 plus 1, it's, it's going to give us 7, which is not less than 6, so we can't update this. So just update that to 26. And then in the last step, we say, what's the next lowest? The next lowest unvisited node is 6. And we say, what's its neighbours? Its neighbours is this one here. It has one neighbour. Um, and we see once again that the current cost of this node is 26. But if we do 6 plus 1, we can get to 7, which is lower than 26. And therefore, we update the, the, uh, the cost of the last node. Uh, and so this allows us to find the shortest path length to the desired nodes, which in this case is 7. So the shortest path length between this node and this node is 7. And if we actually want to trace out the trajectory of the shortest path, we can use this uh, matrix here, which I haven't gone into a lot of detail, but this basically tells us where to go from. So if we're at node uh, F, we should go to node E. So we should go from F to E. If we're at node E, we should go to node B. So if we're at E, we should go to B. If we're at node B, we should go to, to A. This tells us how to trace our path. So I've gone through that pretty quick. If you have any questions, I'd be very happy to, to sit down with you after and go through that in a, in a little more, more detail. The key point is though, is that once you have, you can visit a, a node, so in this case, the node is 11, the cost can always become reduced there's another way to get to that node that is of lower, lower cost, so you can update this. Um, negative edge weight. So I've already mentioned that Dijkstra's algorithm doesn't work for networks that have negative edge weight. So with functional connectivity networks, it's often that you'll have negative uh, pistons correlation will be negative. So what do you do in that case? Uh, as I mentioned, you can either eliminate those with your thresholding do thresholding to make sure that you set the threshold high enough so that the negative weights are thrown out and you don't have to deal with the problem. The other way is that you can take the absolute value. There's some potential interpretational issues with that because you're saying that very, very negative weights are essentially the same as very strong positive weights. Another approach is, is that there are actual algorithms alternative to Dijkstra's algorithm that can be applied to networks with negative weights. And one of those is the Bellman Ford um, algorithm. Uh, however, there's some subtleties there, namely that it must be a, a, a directed network. And I'm not going to go into those here. And it's not, it's very rare you see connect time except that actually that anyone's actually used this, this approach. Another way of doing it, you might think, well, 
if my network has negative edges, why don't I just add the most negative, so as I've shown in this example here, um, the shortest path, the true shortest path is, so note there's a negative edge here, minus two. Uh, so the shortest path here would be one, minus two, one, which is zero, the path length of zero, right? One minus two plus one is, is zero. So the shortest path would go along this edge here. Um, you might say, well, to make this uh, network have positive edges, why don't I just add two to every edge? So if I add two to this, this will become zero. If I add two here, this will become three. If I add two here, this will become three. If I add two here, this will become three. So if I add two to all the edges, the shortest path ends up becoming this direct link, right? Which is a, a weight three. Whereas the true shortest path is actually this curve here. So actually adding, if you just take the most negative weight in your network and add the absolute value of that, so in this case minus two, if you add two to all the edges, sure, that's going to make all of your edges in your network positive, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that Dijkstra's algorithm will give you the correct shortest path. Do you see why that's the case? If I add two to all of those, that it's not going to give me the... Yeah? What's the meaning of this? Uh, so it's a good question. What, so I think the, the general question is what does a negative um, edge mean in, in a network? So with measures of uh, diffusion, measures of structural connectivity such as diffusion MRI, you won't get negative values. So streamline counts are necessarily positive or zero. You don't get any negative. With fMRI, you, there is a possibility because the Pearson correlation can go from minus one to one, that you end up with negative weights. And this largely depends on the pre-processing. So there's some pre-processing steps that will make sure that they will essentially center the distribution of edge weights so that you have negative and positive. Um, some people might say that negative edge weights correspond to inhibition, inhibitory connections. It's not really clear that, that that's, that's the case. So there's no, um, it, it's hard to make emphasis to what a, what a negative. Maybe Alex might have a, have a different interpretation of what. Uh, sorry, has a. Complementary. Competitive. Oh, competitive. I mean, potentially, you might have. There might be, but it's it's hard. It's, it's difficult to say to definitively say that a negative connection to, to give it to ascribe a biological interpretation to a, a negative a negative edge weight. So we know that, for example, if you do there's some pre-processing steps that will greatly increase the number of negative edges in your fMRI connectivity matrix. Um, so it's, it's probably unlikely that just by doing a pre-processing step, suddenly you're going to in introduce a whole lot of competitive or inhibitory uh, connections. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't be more specific to you a sort of a very specific answer, but I don't think that there's a, a, a very definitive understanding of what a negative edge weight corresponds to. Um, so what, what do we do once we've mapped that, so, so once we can characterize and compute the shortest paths in a network, we can do this for all possible pairs of nodes in a network. So if we've got, say for example, a, a, a connectome with a hundred nodes or a thousand nodes, there's going to be thousands of pairs of nodes between which we can compute a shortest path. So we can have a path length for thousands of nodes and the question is how can we ca uh, characterize this in a succinct, with a succinct summary measure? And the, and the simplest measure is referred to as the characteristic path length and it's just the average of the path length between all pairs of nodes. So the, the, the LIJ here just denotes the path length between nodes i and j uh, and we're summing this across all possible pairs of nodes in the network 
and taking the average of the win on n minus 1 is the, the number of pairs of nodes minus the diagonal, the diagonal element of the, of the connectivity uh, matrix. And this provides us a summary measure of the average path length in, in the network. One of the disadvantages of this is that if our network is fragmented, I've already uh, introduced this, this, uh, this complication of the fragmented networks, is that computing the path length between any of these components is, is ill-defined. So the path length is essentially infinite. There's no path between this red node and this blue node, this red node and this, and this green node. So if we compute the characteristic path length for such a graph in which there's disconnected components, the characteristic path length will also be infinite, which is not a very useful uh, characterization. Um, one way around this is to compute either the global efficiency or the harmonic mean of, of path lengths. Uh, these are two related measures. In fact, one is just the reciprocal of, of the other. So the global efficiency is the reciprocal of the harmonic harmonic mean. So in general you'd only consider one of these measures that be highly, uh, they're highly related to each other because they need to consider uh, uh, both. So with global efficiency, rather than taking the, the mean of the shortest path, we take one on, we take the reciprocal of the shortest path. And so if we have an infinite path length, this becomes zero, it contributes zero. So remember one on infinity is zero. And so if we have a fragmented network where the path length between two, between a node and two of these fragmented components is infinite, this simply contributes zero to our sum. Um, and therefore, if we have very short path lengths, this value goes up. And so the higher the efficiency of the network, in general, the, the better or the shorter the path lengths between the different nodes of, of the network. The harmonic mean is, is another way that's also used in, in, in the literature, and this is where we just take the, the reciprocal of, of the efficiency. Uh, so in other words, we compute, once again, it's one on, so this issue of having an infinite path length <laughs> is not going to bother us here anymore because one on infinity is zero, and we take the inverse of that. So once again, this will be the case where uh, networks with very long path lengths um, have a long harmonic mean of the, the, the characteristic path length. So these are two alternatives. In summary, these are two alternative measures that you might want to use in the case that your network is fragmented. But of course, these can also be used in non-fragmented networks. Um, the last thing that I want to uh, finish up on, if I haven't run out of time, I think I still have a, a little bit of time, is the is the consideration of alternative measures of communication. So thus far we've only considered um, shortest paths. Uh, and so the assumption here is, is that information between a pair of nodes only ever traverses one fixed path, one contiguous sequence uh, of edges. The other assumption here is that in computing a shortest path, as you might have gathered from when I presented the details of the mechanics of, the mechanics of Dijkstra's algorithm, that we really need to know, to, to compute a shortest path, we need to know, we need to have information about all edge weights in the network. And this might be an unrealistic assumption in brain networks. Uh, so there's some alternatives. One alternative is referred to as navigation. And this is an approach where what we do, rather than looking for a shortest path, by using Dijkstra's algorithm, what we do is we start at a node and we look at its neighbours. So if I'm in a given node, I might say that I'm connected to three other neighbours. And I go to the neighbour that takes me closest to my desired destination. So there might be one neighbour that's um, yeah, a given, say, five or ten centimetres away, another that's 20, and another that's, that's two. I would go and make a locally greedy decision and go to the, my direct neighbor that's closest to my desired destination. So I walk to that neighbor, and when I get to that neighbor, I then evaluate my new set of neighbors at that node. And I once again walk towards the neighbor that takes me to the closest I can possibly get to my desired destination. This is a locally greedy approach referred to as navigation. 
Uh, the disadvantage of this is that I might, in fact, never get to my neighbor. So if I use this locally greedy approach, I might get to a dead end, uh, or I might go into a loop. So I keep looping over the same set of edges again and again and again, and I never get to my uh, destination. But there is some work that's shown that in brain networks, the particular brain networks is, um, is set up in a way that's quite favorable to the brain being navigable. So most pairs of nodes, uh, we can navigate with this, greedy, uh, with this greedy approach. Another approach is based on diffusion. And this approach is where, rather than focusing on a fixed route, you can think of diffusion more as the flow of water in pipe, so in, in, in a set of pipes. So in a pipe, when we get to a fork in the pipe, so when, the, when we have one pipe that then diverges off into two pipes, some of the flow will go in, into one end of one, one side of the fork and uh, some of the other flow will go into the, the other side. So it's essentially split into two. And this is really referred to in the, the radio literature as diffusion. So rather than going along one fixed path, we can analyze the network in a scenario where the information essentially is, is uh, replicated across two forks and if it gets to another fork it's replicated again and so on and so forth. And so we have this kind of a, a broadcasting effect where all of, the, all of the edges become saturated as the information propagates through the network. Uh, so these are, haven't been investigated in a great amount of detail in the connectomics literature, but the, the yep. Knows where to start. Oh, stop. Um, so a simple stopping criteria would be once it gets to its target. So you could say that if you have a target in mind, you stop at that target. One of the difficulties, and I think what you might be getting at, is with diffusion, you could have a scenario where you loop back onto itself. So a flow can come and join another flow. And so what do you do in that scenario? Do you allow it to join in with the new flow? Um, but yeah, simple stopping criteria is once you get a certain amount of flow to reach your destination, you could say that's what you defines your stopping criteria. But these methods, are, particularly diffusion, are, are relatively new and they haven't been explored in brain networks to any uh, large extent. The only one that has been, that, that's consistent, and I'll briefly mention this, is, is a measure called communicability. And this is, yep? So with, with navigation, the algorithm is, um, it's a very simple, it's a greedy algorithm. All that you do is you start at your node and you say, what are my neighbors? And you say, if I have a given number of neighbors, I compute the distance from each of my neighbors to my desired destination. So you know, I might have three neighbors, so I go to those three neighbors and say, neighbor one, how far away are you from my desired, by, by far away I mean the actual physical distance, the Euclidean distance, or some other measure of distance and say, how far away are you from my desired destination? Neighbor two, how far away are you from my desired? Neighbor three, how far are you away? And, I, and they each tell me how far away they are, and I choose the one that's the closest. And I go to that one, I walk over to the one that's the closest, and then when I get, I ask them again, when I'm at that note, I say, I look at that node's neighbors, and I say, which of those neighbors are closer to my desired destination? So I keep walking along uh, until hopefully I reach my desired node, and that's not guaranteed though, so navigability doesn't necessarily guarantee that I get to my desired node. With diffusion, there's a whole range of different ways of, of, of computing. There's, there's no really fixed way of, 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 uh, of, of computing diffusion. So um, there's subtleties in the way that information can flow back on itself, the stopping criteria and so on. So it's still a relatively Europe. But I can give you, I'll give you one example of diffusion here, which is referred to as communicability. And this is a measure that's received a little attention, or actually a fair amount of attention in the, in the recent literature that's consistent with, with diffusion. And this is the case where we essentially consider all possible paths. So if I have a source and a destination, I consider all possible paths between that source, actually not paths, in fact walks. Remember, a walks are, are, are paths that can traverse the same node or the same edge more than once. And this is essentially the formula here for, for communicability. So you're essentially taking 
the connectivity matrix to a power n. And so what you, I'll describe this in a moment, when you take a matrix to a power of n, you're essentially considering the paths that traverse exactly n edges, n hops. And what you do, you downweight the contribution of those paths by this uh, factor n. So the longer, the more number of hops that you traverse, the lower the contribution, or the con contribution is tempered by this, by this term here. So I can give you an example here. This is a path of this, this very simple network. This is the connectivity matrix for that network. So 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 3. So this is the matrix A. If I raise this to the power of 2, I see that there's a connection, or that there's one path. So the 1 here means that there's one path between node 1 and 3. And uh, a, a path, uh, uh, sorry, so when I raise this to the power of 2, that means between node 1, sorry, between node 2 and 3, there's a path of 2 hops. So if I go 2 and 3, 1, 2. That's the two, uh, the two hot path between. If I go to three, so now when I raise this to the power of three, I'm only interested in paths that traverse three hops. I have a three hop path between one and three, and that would be um, one, two, three. Now you could say that's not a very realistic path, right? I'm just going, I go, go to three, and then come back to one, and then I go to three again. Why would I? Why would I do that? Why would that represent a biologically realistic path? Why, you know, I get to I get to three. I'm at my destination. I'm stopped. Why would I then go back to one? Uh, so that's one of the. So this is a particular instantiation, a particular representation of the diffusion model. But you can argue that this is not. That perhaps this is not a realistic model of diffusion in the sense that you have paths that that can loop back on each other multiple times. The counter argument to that is that such a path would be downweighted by a factor by three factorial. So such a path that looks back on itself would get would get downweighted. Um, once again, I think I'm running out of time, so I won't spend too much. But I'd be happy to chat with you if you're interested in communicability. So the last slide, this is the last slide for the afternoon before we go to the prats, is that in one of the advanced prats we have the idea of a random and a targeted attack. Um, and this refers to the fact that some networks, the, the hub nodes are particularly vulnerable to attack. So if there's some kind of disease or pathology that attacks the hub nodes, the, uh, the uh, efficiency, so remember the efficiency is a measure of path length in, in a network, the efficiency begins to drop very fast. So what I mean by a targeted attack is that if I have my uh, nodes in the network and I order them according to their degree, so I put the hub nodes at the start of my list, so these are the very high degree nodes, and at the, at, the, at the end of the list I have my very low degree nodes. And I say, I'm going to attack those nodes with very high degree, I'm going to take them out of the network and throw away their edges. And so what I've done here in this targeted attack, I take the highest, the, the, the strongest hub, throw it away and compute the efficiency. Take the next highest, throw it away, recompute the efficiency. And you can see that with this targeted attack, the efficiency of the network begins to drop very, very fast, right? When I throw away, I only need to throw away, I only need to eliminate a few of these high degree hubs for the efficiency to start to drop very quickly. In contrast, with a random attack, if I just choose nodes at random, not necessarily the hub nodes, that the network efficiency still remains, uh, or the, the decay is much slower, right? You don't get this very fast drop in inefficiency. So this would say that these hub nodes are particularly crucial to the efficiency of the network. And if disease or some sort of pathology affects these hub nodes, that the network, the efficiency of the network is going to drop very quick. This is the case of a brain network. Now if you look at a random network, we see that the difference between a targeted and a, and a, and a, and a random attack is much less. So we still see that a targeted attack results in a slightly faster decay compared to a random attack, but there isn't as much of a difference as what we see in a, in a brain network. So by random network, I just mean a network where we have some nodes and we connect the, the nodes purely by chance. So we flip a coin, if the 
coins and head, we put it node, otherwise we put it there's, there's uh, no, no edge between the, the, the pair of nodes. So this would give you some suggestion that the fact that brain networks have hubs and that these hubs are particularly sensitive to uh, attack. So in one of the advanced exercises, uh, you're asked to uh, essentially replicate this, this, this curve for one of the networks that we, uh, we provide you with. So it's just a matter of sorting the nodes according to their degree and then eliminating the nodes according to 